Hi, welcome back to this last module in the series where we get to apply what we've learned about mental status exam and the terminology around psychosis and also what we know about diagnosis to Emperor Norton. So I'm going to go back over our original interview and point out things that we can learn just from watching his testimonial. The mental status exam is really a, uh, the art of careful observation and organization of observation. And I'm gonna help you do that here. So it's important to understand that as we begin to know Emperor Norton, we really can't know him as we would if we were talking to him directly. We're putting this together from pieces of the historical record and from his proclamations that were published in the newspaper. So we're really operating from a only a partial database. But some things become evident just from the minute he walks in the room. He appears to have no abnormal movements, his speech has a normal rate, rhythm, and volume, albeit with that kind of peculiar 19th century uh, vernacular. But where it starts to get particularly useful is where he begins to describe some of his past history. So let's take a close look at that. I was 28 years old and using money that I had inherited from my father before leaving Algoa Bay, South Africa, I began buying and selling goods. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, he's made it to 28 years old without exhibiting any symptoms of any kind of major psychotic disorder, such as uh, psychosis, uh, sorry, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And not only does he appear asymptomatic, he appears to have been functional in his work, uh, which is also really important because those are conditions which often cause marked functional impairment. So let's continue to pay attention to his his uh, history here as he describes it. Let me get to the right time point. I was 39 years old at that point. I went to the newspaper and I made my grand proclamation. I said at the preeminatory request of a large majority of these citizens of the United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the past nine years and 10 months of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor. So we can gather a few important pieces of data here. One, he did not show any kind of delusional symptoms until he was 39 years old, which would be a very late onset for schizophrenia or even bipolar disorder. Uh, we can also tell that he used language in a fairly conventional way. So this uh, would be a, a vote against something like a formal thought disorder where his language would likely to be disorganized or he might show significant uh, negativism in his presentation. Now, I think we can all agree that declaring oneself emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico would qualify as a grandiose thought, and he certainly uh, qualifies for that. So again, let's look at some of his proclamations. For me to clear the halls of the Capitol, a popular idea. Some of my decrees were more local. I suggested that we should prevent gunfights, as a, which was a common means of settling a dispute back then. I also decreed that newly arrived immigrants should be protected from the rapacity of landlords and assisted in their business. And once I stood before a mob of anti-Chinese troublemakers bent on some attacking some of the residents of our Chinatown, and I said the Lord's Prayer until they dispersed. Now you might be wondering if I was a religious man. Now while I was raised Jewish, I attended all the different houses of worship in San Francisco. I did not want any of them to become jealous. So again, we can tell some important things here. Uh, one is that his behavior, while unusual, peculiar even, uh, was not bizarre. He did not have any very outlandish ideas like he was being possessed by spirits or controlled by, by machines or anything like that that we might see in somebody who had schizophrenia. In fact, all of his behaviors and declarations fit within the framework of if he were an emperor. And so he's, his delusion is well contained to that one particular area of thought process. Uh, and the religiosity is important here too, because uh, religion often will enter into the thought process of somebody who, uh, it's very common in cases of mania, 
it often shows up in schizophrenia. And in this case, he's almost sort of humoring the idea of religion and saying, you know, again, staying within the framework of an emperor, I don't want you to become jealous uh, that, I, that I have a particular favoritism towards one group or another. Now, what if this was a substance-induced psychotic disorder? Let's consider that possibility. But unlike the king, I was not a drunk. I might have one drink a day if I was bought one by a newspaper reporter. One. So again, one drink a day, probably not an alcohol use disorder or a kind of delirium caused by intermittent alcohol withdrawal. Now, if I was interviewing him in my 19th century office, I might inquire about laudanum, which was a very common opiate tincture at the time, but there's nothing in the historical record to imply that Emperor Norton had a problem with laudanum. Now, do we know if he had any psychiatric history? That's another important part of any, any history gathering. Let's take a look and see what we can learn from that. I was arrested for vagrancy, the insult. I produced to the police officer my room key from my flop house and some money in my pocket to show that I was not a vagrant, but they kept me in jail overnight, saying I was a lunatic. The next day, while well, the commissioner of lunacy set me free, not only set me free, but upbraided the arresting officer. And from that point forward, the constabulary saluted me as I passed on the street. So we can gather a couple of important pieces of information here. One is that he did not appear to have ever been committed to an asylum or treated for a mental health disorder. Now, I'm sure the, uh, the mental health system of Gold Rush San Francisco was pretty scant, but there's nothing to indicate he even had many run-ins with the police, just this one time where he, was, um, where he was picked up by the police. And part of this is probably because he was not gravely disabled. He had a place to live, albeit it was simple. He lived in what we would now call a single room occupancy hotel. Uh, he certainly was able to get food from restaurants and he had clothing, not just any clothing, but fabulous clothing. He had the uniforms of an emperor. And so he was able to meet his basic needs and he would not be considered uh, gravely disabled. Now, um, what about this thing about issuing currency? What do we think about that? Of course, can issue his own currency. And so I did. I offered promissory bonds ranging from 50 cents to $10. Restaurant. Here again, we see delusions that are consistent with a single theme, that he is the emperor of the United States, and that these delusions are fixed, unyielding, and he is not interested in changing it. It was said that the only thing that could get Emperor Norton angry was questioning his legitimacy as the emperor of the United States. Now, was he cognitively disorganized or socially impaired? Is there anything in his history to, uh, to suggest that he was? Let's take a look. Affecting the streets of San Francisco and conversing with my subjects. It was well known that I could hold court on just about any subject with the utmost intelligence and eloquence. Again, here is a guy who walks around San Francisco, can talk about the events of the day, is not cognitively disorganized, is not impaired socially, is certainly peculiar, uh, but does not have some of those negative symptoms that we would expect to see in somebody who has schizophrenia. Now, what about the course of his condition? Is there anything to suggest that it had a waxing or waning course? Let's take a look at that question. sum of $25. I reigned for over 21 years in the young city of San Francisco. When I collapsed and died at the age of 60 while I was on my way to a debate at California and Grant Street, 10,000 people attended my funeral. So again, here we show symptoms that are consistent over time. Now, it would not be surprising for somebody in the throes of a manic episode to declare themselves emperor of the United States. But here was a guy who maintained this same narrative for the entire 20 plus years that he reigned as emperor of the United States. And so this is, this is really nothing to suggest a kind of waxing and waning course that we would expect to see in somebody with bipolar disorder. So let's think about a quick differential diagnosis here. So, do we think that he had bipolar disorder? 
As I said, without that waxing and waning course, it's unlikely. While his grandiosity would be congruent with mania, there's nothing to indicate that he had periods of depression. What about schizophrenia? Well, again, we don't see any of that kind of impairment that we would expect to see in both function and social capacity and capacity for organized thought that we would see in somebody with schizophrenia. So the most likely diagnosis for Emperor Norton, if we were to give him a diagnosis at all, would be something called a delusional disorder. And the interesting thing about delusional disorders is sometimes when a person has a delusional disorder, and by definition, a delusional disorder typically is circumscribed around one particular area, in this particular case, uh, that he was the emperor of the United States. It's uh, occasionally another person will share the delusion with that person. The French have a wonderful term for this. They call it a foyadu, a madness for two. And the case study that I'm going to ask you to read by Eric Liss coined a really beautiful new term, and he called it a foyaville. Uh, really, that this was a madness of uh, Emperor Norton that was shared with the young city of San Francisco. And it really begs some very interesting questions of, did Emperor Norton have a mental illness? Well, he certainly had symptoms, but did he suffer? I would say that he did not, and that he was not only able to take care of his basic needs, he was taken care of by the entire city. The saloons fed him, the flop house took his, his paper currency, and people saluted him on the streets. They not only tolerated him, they celebrated him. There were actually postcards published of him. He was a tourist attraction. Uh, he was a beloved man. 10,000 people came to his funeral. And so I ask you, did he actually have a mental illness? And I don't have a good answer to that question, but I think it's worth pondering because there are probably plenty of people walking around the world today who have these eccentricities, maybe even sub-threshold psychotic symptoms who would probably not qualify for a DSM diagnosis. And arguably, they really add a lot of color to our world and make it a more interesting place. So I want you to go ahead and read the, the brief case study that I've assigned to you. And if you get a chance, I really wanna encourage you to check out, uh, this is um, the Emperor Norton tour, which happens in downtown San Francisco, led by Joseph Amster. He's uh, you know, the tour guide here, he dresses in this, this fantastic outfit. He is, has an encyclopedic knowledge of all things about early San Francisco and especially around Emperor Norton. And this is my inspiration for this talk and where I learned a lot of the things that I've shared with you today. So I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope uh, that you can uh, enjoy and appreciate one of San Francisco's most eclectic and eccentric characters. Thanks. <laughs>